afternoon to everyone who came to our second lecture. Today we will be working directly with images from manuscript Cambridge University Library KK425, as was promised last time. So we are beginning, of course, with the binding. You already know it is new, but looking at it, you don't need to be a professional codicologist to understand that the binding is indeed new. You'll see it brown leather, and I'll tell you. It is a goat leather, which is called Morocco. Goat leather is called Morocco. If you see Morocco somewhere, it means it is made from goat. Goat leather can be of any color. Usually they are brown, black, blue and green. Those are frequently encountered in vinyls of 17th, 18th and 19th centuries. There are no levels or inscriptions on the binding. On the side, you will find one, two, three double poles, which are intended to cover sewing stations, that is, the threads by which the manuscript corpus is attached to the binding physically. We turn the binding, next, uh, next image, please. We turn the binding and we get inside the manuscript itself. This leaf as I have already mentioned, is called Pace Down. Because it is at, at the front cover, it is front of Pace Down. You understand that bindings book have front of cover and respectively rear cover. There we have a rear Pace Down. As a rule, with a rear, rear exception, Pace Downs are contemporary to the binding. But in this case, the situation is different and you can now see it for yourself. As you see, please look carefully, this space down leaf is not integrated with the next leaf, which will be called a frontal fly leaf. There is a tiny gap, which implies that this space down was made early and was glued to more modern binding. What you will see further is very important. Unfortunately, most manuscripts don't provide table of contents, but this manuscript, lucky for us, does. We see that the table of contents is written by different hands. The first handwriting is perhaps from the 17th century. Further on, it continues here and there, there are later notes. Most likely from 18, perhaps the very beginning of 19. Then we have something written in pencil. Then we have here a book plate from the Cambridge University Library, date, and so on. As you understand, and as we have already talked about, there are several things here that couldn't have been done until manuscript entered the university library, which, as you remember, happened in 1654. Only then the manuscript got, it, got its current shelf mark. So this record gives us a terminus antiquum. Accordingly, everything written here is most likely from the end of 17th century, I mean the main, the main hand. Remember I told you that this manuscript has 18 units bound together. Here only part of them are mentioned. The 17th century librarian didn't understand what other section this manuscript contained, but nevertheless this librarian did a very important job. Imagine that some leaves section are missing from the, this manuscript, yet their former presence is signaled through the table of contents. Always, always examine these details meticulously, because firstly, they can assist you in performing the difficult work that you might struggle to navigate independently, and secondly, it is pivotal to acknowledge the commendable efforts of 17th century librarians. So please don't overlook their diligence. Furthermore, you can determine that some portion of the manuscript have been lost. 
A prime, uh, a prime example is the pencil note at the bottom, likely inscribed by Henry Bradshaw. Recall our previous discussion about his notes appearing at the end of the manuscript. It indicates that the last leaves of this manuscript constituting the impunabula were misbound, detached, and are now housed separately with its own shelf mark in the same university library but in the hall designated for impunabula and prayer books. We observe an ex libris affixed later and here with this we conclude uh, we, we finish our examination of the frontal face down. As evident and previously mentioned, the front flyleaf is contemporary to the binding. Its parchment composition is quite apparent. It is blank and, generally speaking, doesn't harbor anything of great interest. Again, a gap is noticeable between the base down and the frontal flyleaf. This leaf leaves often contain the myriads of library notes, but this is not the case here. Nonetheless, you must observe them closely. If they are comprised of paper, even if added later, pay keen attention to the presence of watermark, and it can provide significant information regarding the paper provenance. We go directly in the manuscript. Next slide, please. We examine the first leaf, which is notably soiled, a detail that immediately captures one's attention. This suggests only one thing. For considerable duration, this leaf served as the first leaf of this manuscript, otherwise it wouldn't exhibit such wear and soil. Advance it forward. I'll Note that this is not the beginning of the treatise, but rather a continuation of the text called Imago Mundi, authored by famous theologian of the 12th century, Honorius of Otton. That's one thing. What else do we see? We see that the leaves have been trimmed at the edges. At the bottom, on the right, and at the top. This is called trimming. It is a very, very common thing. It happens almost every time that you change the binding. Almost always, when you rebind the manuscript, you trim the leaves. What else do we see here? We see that in the leaf there is no title. This is one of the first things to which we pay attention. It should be first indication that probably this is not the beginning of the original treatise, but something is missing. Then we already have to do the textological anal analysis to determine what the text is and what portion of the text has been lost. And look at how many leaves approximately are missing. In this way, you can make your pre preliminary conclusion about how many leaves were originally in the manuscript. Of course, you can play Advocatus Diaboli and say, okay, maybe the first part wasn't supposed to be here. Such an option is always possible. But then you will need to study the tradition of all manuscripts of the Mago Mundi that have survived and reached us. It is a big deal, but it can and very often needs to be done. What else do we do? What else do we see here? We see what are called small initials, minor initials, and we see they are alternatively red and blue. Red and blue. This is very common for medieval and Renaissance manuscripts. Red, blue, red, blue. And when it is blue, it has the so-called red fanwalk, which is also quite common. What else do we see? We see that the text is written in two columns. There is a large distance between them. In some place we see lines made with grey and brown ink. Ruined. Here they are visible. We see that the text of the upper line 
is set above the top line. We remember this is the rule of Nile curve, top line, bottom line. What else do we see? We see bounding lines, left, middle, right, and the erased line on the right. Most likely, they went here at the top and here at the bottom to the margins, but most likely they were erased. So you see a very typical system, so-called planning system, one, two, one. We continue with the first view. This next slide, please. We see this is still very dirty and so. Remember, I mentioned the precons for the lining. Here you see them, here they were on the left, and they are even slightly, slightly visible, but they were cut off. We will see better on the next leaves. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Foliation. Foliation here is made with Arabic numerals. And as I told you, obviously, this is a modern foliation. Since until the 15th century, Roman numerals would be mostly used. This leaf is already quite clean, except for its margins. We see handwriting much better as well as more clearly visible bounding lines here, here and here. We see some additions. Several words which are certainly well written by later hand. We see that the ink is different. Next slide, please. We see, uh, we see original flow of the manuscript. Um, uh, we see the original flow of manuscript. The threads have rotted. Now they are not there. This happened at the stage of preparing the skin, when the manuscript was scrapped and clean of hair. The form of these flows are usually round and oval. Leaves a second versa and free rector. Here it is already clearly visible that vertical bounding lines only reach the margins. Here they are, and here they are not erased. We see the number 3 is duplicated. We see it at the top, and we see it at the bottom. At the bottom. We see some notes, obviously made by another hand. At the bottom. We also see prickings at the margins, which are not completely cut off here, and you understand they coincide with these lines. Next slide, please. Here is the this rubric, which means we have a new part of the book or a new chapter. I already mentioned that some portions of the text in KK are written in black ink. Since the black ink was used where scribes wanted to make corrections and where they want them to be better visible. This is something that was first erased and written again. And at the top here, please pay your attention, the initials have become more small, smaller and don't have their rainbow, but they are still alternatively blue, red, blue, red. Please go to uh, click 17. We see this with different handwriting, and at the bottom appears. 
So of the trials, you see, usually they, when they try them, they write alphabet. We see this handwriting is most likely from the 16th century, and it will appear several more times in this manuscript. And most likely, this hand will be responsible for several sketches of drawings that we will see later. We can see something green from this side. What's that? It means this is something that shines through the shines through from the other side. What does this mean? It means the parchment is very, very thin. That is, even if you don't have the opportunity to examine the manuscript itself, this shine through provide, provides evidence that the parchment is indeed very thin. Thank you.